Our first speaker today, and for all this conference, is uh, Father John Baer, who is Professor of Patriastics, Patriotics, teaching at St. Vladimir's Seminary and at uh, Vrij University in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He earned his uh, Doctor of Philosophy degree in theology from Oxford University back to 1995. He's author of uh, quite a lot of publications. And today, Father John will be speaking about the death as a last frontier. Please, Father John. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation and for all the hospitality. We live by hope. Hope in the mystery of God revealed in Christ. As we heard in all those scriptural quotations read so beautifully by the children that was on the screen a few minutes ago. We live by hope, but we are in crisis. A crisis that confounds our hope and even leads us to misplace our hope. And this crisis has its roots in the twin phenomena of the industrialization and urbanization in recent centuries and is growing in its ramifications, economic, ethical, bioethical, anthropological, and not least theological, to a truly epic scale. While undoubtedly bringing great boons to those fortunate enough to benefit from them, the extension of this industrialization into medical practice and dealing with the dead, though noted by many, have profound and unsettling implications for human life that have not, I'm going to argue, been sufficiently analyzed or even recognized. What I have in mind is the profoundly radical, tectonic even, changes that we in Western society have undergone over the last couple of centuries, and which I don't think we've really begun to fully appreciate. We live in a radically different world compared to our forebears. Our forebears of just a few generations ago, let alone millennia ago. Over the last couple of centuries, modern medicine through scientific inquiry, technical ability, social organization, has had a tremendous success in dealing with illness, all but eradicating various diseases that would have decimated earlier populations. I'm going to be turning to the quotations on the sheet later on, so leave off looking at them for now until we get to them. We now have health care, access to health care, which would have been simply unimaginable, even to our predecessors. We can rightly, confidently, expect that most of the sufferings that were previously thought to be inevitable and untreatable can now be remedied. We have every expectation that virtually every illness can be treated so that we can live long and prosper with joy and with every hope. But this has resulted in several modifications. For instance, Jean-Claude Lachey, in his book on the, the theology of illness, notes, he says, that the development of medicine in a purely naturalistic perspective has served to objectify illness, making of it a reality considered in itself and for itself. What he means is that sicknesses are now something that are uniquely physiological, independent of the afflicted person. So that rather than treating the patient, the patient being the one who suffers, physicians today treat or cure the illness, the illness of the afflicted organs, through ever more sophisticated, abstract technical processes. And so they depersonalize medical therapy isolating the patient from their disease. Secondly, this means that the patient is not in fact treated. The illness is attacked, 
the diseased organ is singled out and worked upon, but there's no attempt to help the patient understand or find meaning in their suffering. All that is left to them is to turn to the physician in whose hands their fate resides. So it's not the patient as a suffering one who is treated, but the illness which is attacked. While the patient suffers the treatment of modern medicine, hoping thereby to find healing, relief, ultimately hoping to regain life. So the physician has come to be, as Michel Foucault puts it, the physician is the priest of modern times, the one who can save lives, the one who has the power of life and death. Just think about it. When you fall sick, who do you go and see? The physician or your priest? So we've now come to live a mode of life in which we not only hope for, but have come to expect that our life will be free from pain, sickness, and suffering. That we've come to escape the conditions that have been endemic to human life as our ancestors knew it. And that we can continue to grow in attaining a form of life completely free from such limitations, not knowing sickness or suffering. And we hope in that. As I said, we live in a radically different world than our forebears. And perhaps to take this to the final level, this is nowhere more true than in our understanding of death. For I would argue that very few people today in the West, modern Western Europe, North America, very few people actually see death. Yes, we know that people die. We hear about catastrophes all the time. Occasionally we see their bodies. But compared to the situation just a century ago, there's a huge difference. At the beginning of the 20th century, most people would have had one or more of their brothers or sisters die during their period of childhood. One or more parent dying before they reach adulthood. And now today, our parents live on till we ourselves are beyond the life expectancy of previous ages. Many people today have reached the age of 70 and their parents are still alive. They've never known anybody dying. Previously, Deceased siblings, parents, and friends would have been kept at home in the parlor, in the living room, being mourned and waked by friends and neighbors, washed and prepared for burial at home until taken from home to church where they would be commended to God and then buried in the earth and entrusted to the earth for safekeeping until the resurrection. And we would have seen that whole cycle of death probably monthly, between our friends, our neighbors, the village, the town, and so on. Today, however, the corpse is removed as quickly as possible. In fact, in North America, I'm going off script now, I'm ignoring the translators, but in North America, it really is true that there's only two ways in which you can die today. You can either die by accident, a car crash or something, or you can die at home. But if you die at home, the police have to come to find out what happened. Yeah? The whole situation is completely reversed. So um, it's the exception, it's the anomaly to die at home peacefully. The police have to come. Otherwise, it's dying by a, an accident or you're dying in hospital. We'll come back to hospital in a minute. Today, the corpse, when, when the body dies, the corpse is removed as quickly as possible. It's taken to the care of the death professionals, the morticians, who then embalm the body to make it look as good as it can possibly be. In North America, the body is then placed in a, in a funeral home un, under pink lights. They've actually got pink lights in the funeral home to make it look as if the body is still living. And in the hope that we make a comment such as, I've never seen them looking so good. The casket is then closed during the funeral service, or is increasingly happening today in North America. There is no funeral service. The body is disposed of in a crematorium, often without anybody being there. And then there will be a memorial service 
later on, two, three, four weeks later, in which the person is celebrated without actually being there. So all of this presents a very ambiguous and disturbing attitude towards the body. No longer seeing death, our focus is ever more on the body. We exercise more than any generation ever. We look after our body more than any generation ever before. And we might do so under a veneer of Christian theology. We might argue that ours is an incarnational faith in which the body is a temple of the spirit, and therefore I must do everything I can to preserve the body as well as it can be for the spirit. But then when it comes to death, we discard the coils of our mortal flesh and think of the person as being liberated, liberated from the body. So today you can really say we die, sorry, we live as hedonists and we die as Platonists. We spend our whole life living for the body in one way or another, and then when we die we say liberated from the body. In a very real sense, we no longer see death today. And by death, I mean the full liturgy of death, as I described it earlier. We don't live with it as an ever-present reality, as every generation of human beings has done before us. To put it at its most extreme, today, in fact, we must be killed in order to die. Because what we call life is capable of being sustained indefinitely by the machines in a hospital. The machines must be switched off for the person to die. I'm always reminded of the verse in the book of Revelations, chapter 9. In those days, they will seek death, but will not be able to find it. They will long for death, and death will fly away from them. Now, clearly, there's been a lot of discussion over the last half century or so about our denial of death. The erasure of the process of dying, the dead person and death itself, has been pointed out many times before. Someone like Ernest Becker, the denial of death. But it seemed to me that the problem is, in fact, much deeper and much more difficult. Most basically, if it's true, as the Orthodox have been singing for the last several weeks, that Christ has trampled down death by death, if it's true, and what that means is that if it's true that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being, remember, it's by showing us, he shows us what it is to be God by the way he dies, trampling down death by death. Then quite simply, if we no longer see death today, we no longer see the face of God. If we cannot see death, we will not see the face of God. If we don't see death, we have no basis for seeing that life, in fact, comes through death, as we say repeatedly so often in our hymnography. If we don't see death, our horizon will become totally imminent. It will be about this life, and its perpetuation, about saving this life with the, priest, with, sorry, with the physician as a high priest of modernity, the one who's got the power to save life. In that case, like cancer, which is basically cells that refuse to die, we have in fact become a cancerous society. Now, if we don't bear these changes regarding life and death in, hand, in mind, and the radically different situation that we now find ourselves in over the last 50 years or so, if we don't bear those changes in mind, we can easily hear the gospel proclamation about the victory of life over death in terms of our own modern understanding of medicine and its treatment of illnesses. It's treatment of illnesses rather than the patient. When we hear from ancient and modern theologians that sickness and death was brought into the world through, through human disobedience, 
we might now think that Christ has simply reversed the situation. He heals sickness as a modern doctor today might do so. He's conquered death so that we don't have to die. He provides life and life in abundance as we define life today. In the slogans of modern America, life is having it all and more. Be all that you can be. Enjoy life to the full. All of those modern slogans. But we delude ourselves if we think that we will still not fall sick and that we will die however much we try to hide the fact from ourselves. If we recognize and accept the fact of our mortality, then perhaps we can see an even greater depth in the gospel message and in patristic reflection, and a deeper cause for hope. Not hope that we might get out of sickness and death, but hope that we might actually find life in it. Christ didn't destroy death in any other way than through his death, trampling down death by death. And this requires of us our own death in baptism, taking up the cross, bearing witness, martyria, all the way to the tomb for us to share in his life. Christ didn't simply destroy death. After all, everyone in this room is still going to die. But rather, in the language of Hebrews, he has set us free from the fear of death, the fear of death that held us bondage, so that we might now take up the cross and follow him. God didn't simply destroy sickness and death, but rather he turned them inside out, as it were, to an even greater end than the perpetuation of this so-called life, revealing instead a new form of life, the very life of God himself, self-sacrificial love. Now, it's vitally important to recognize that at the heart of the gospel, there is a great reversal. And to recognize how this reversal works. Because it's all too easy to forget it. It's all too easy to begin with the Apostle Paul's conclusions and to start with them as our premise. We all know that Adam sinned and brought death into the world. And so we think that Christ is God's response to Adam's fall. God made everything good, Adam fell, God responded with Christ. Well, if that's the case, Christ would be plan B. Yeah? Plan A is God made everything good, we messed it up, and then God has to respond with Christ. That makes Christ plan B. Well, Christ is not plan B. It's vitally important to recognize that the train of thought which led Paul to the conclusion, it's a conclusion that Adam sinned, death came into the world, Christ was righteous, life came into the world. The train of thought which led to that conclusion is actually the reverse of what he says in it. Before Paul's encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, when he was still Saul, he did not think of himself as a sinner waiting for salvation, waiting for somebody to redeem him, to save him from death. No, he says that he was blameless with respect to the righteousness under the law. He was full of confidence in the flesh. So much so was he considered himself righteous that he persecuted Christians for their obvious heresy. It's only in the light of the encounter with the risen Christ, the one who by his death wrought the resurrection, only then does he reevaluate the situation and the whole reading of Scripture. His argument is this if here is one who conquered death, then it is clear now that death is the last enemy. Yeah? No, it didn't start with Adam's sin, death, then Christ. He starts with Christ who conquers the last enemy, which is death. And then he concludes death was a problem. But the way Christ destroyed death, of course, is by his death. 
If he is the one who is the salvation of all, then and only then is it known that all need salvation. In other words, the solution comes first, and then we see what the problem is. And the problem, now turned inside out, in fact becomes a solution. Death is revealed to be the problem, but it's by his death that Christ conquers death. Yeah, the, solution, the, problems, uh, the solution shows what the problem is, and the problem is turned inside out to become a solution. Now, this way of thinking is so at odds with our modern, linear way of thinking that it can sound extremely paradoxical. So, for instance, one of the most intriguing and difficult of all patristic statements I've ever found is on the, fir on the quotation sheet number one. Okay? And I guess it's going to be translated at the same time, but for those who want to read it, it's here. In English, obviously. So, it's St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Hence, also, Adam himself was termed by Paul the type of the one to come, because the word, the fashion of all things, prefigured in him the future economy relating to the Son of God on behalf of the human race. God having predetermined the first, the animated human, that is, such that he should be saved by the spiritual one. For since the Savior pre-exists, it was necessary that the one to be saved should also exist so that the Savior doesn't exist in vain. So an interesting statement. Since a Savior already exists, it was necessary that the one who would be saved should come into existence so that the Savior doesn't exist in vain. Irenaeus is not thinking in terms of creation plan A, salvation plan B. Rather, creation and salvation belong together as the one single economy of God which culminates in the work of Christ, and which is only understood from the point of view of Christ, told from that starting point. After the Passion, the Scriptures are opened, and from that moment on, we can read from Genesis to Christ. The solution comes first. This is a starting point, and it's a starting point. Christ on the cross, opening the Scriptures, is a starting point which is simultaneously the completion of the creative act begun by God in Genesis. When God in Genesis says, let us make a human being in our image and likeness, that is concluded when Christ on the cross in the Gospel of John says, it is finished. I'm going to talk more about that in my workshop on the Gospel of John um, in a few days' time. When Christ says, it is finished from the cross, he's referring to this initial divine purpose that's complete. Let us make a human being in our image and likeness. This is Christ. He is the true human being in the image, the image of God. Just as Pilate points out just before Christ goes to the cross, behold the human being. So the only thing which is said in Genesis to be God's express purpose after making everything else, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. The only thing which is said to be his project, the only thing for which he doesn't say, let it be, but rather says, let us make, this is completed when we give our let it be, just like Christ did going to the cross. So it's only in the light of the risen Christ that we can say that death came into the world through Adam's sin, but then the important point for us now is that this also means that while it's only in the light of the risen Christ that we can see that death is the last enemy, the last enemy isn't simply dismissed, rendered nothing, or obliterated, but rather the last enemy is turned inside out. It's now also known to be the means by which the last enemy is destroyed. That it's by his death that Christ conquers death. We sing that so many times during Paschal Tide that we no longer listen to it. Trampling down death by death. What was once the end, death, now in fact becomes the beginning, death. 
It's power over human beings, the fear that it introduces, leading us to sin. This power has been voided, emptied, so that we might voluntarily die to ourselves in baptism and a life of taking up the cross thereafter, following Christ. So in that quotation we looked at from Irenaeus, the first quotation, <coughs> he builds upon the Apostle Paul's contrast between Adam and Christ. Adam, he says, was a type of the one to come. And then alluding to 1 Corinthians 15, he distinguishes between Adam as animated by a breath of life, and the second Adam, who's a life-giving spirit. It says the first God, having predetermined that the first, the animated human, should be such that he would be saved by the spiritual one. If the first Adam was animated by a breath of life, he could have used this breath not for himself but for others. But Adam, just like each and every one of us, from our first breath onwards, we do all that we can to preserve it, to perpetuate it, to make it secure. We do everything we can to secure our breath from the very first breath we take. But a breath is inherently transitory. A breath is snatched, and it will expire, no matter how secure we make it. So as Christ says, if you try to preserve your life, you will lose it. No matter how healthily you eat or exercise or whatever else you do to try and preserve your life. But Christ continues, if you lose it for my sake, for the gospel, for the kingdom, for your neighbor, you will gain it. Life comes through death. If we use our breath no longer to live for ourselves, but to die to ourselves, to take up the cross, to live rather for others, for Christ the kingdom, our neighbor, then the life that we'll begin to live cannot be touched by death, because we've entered into it through death. It's the life of the Spirit, a life which cannot die. So you could put the contrast this way. We've come into existence with no choice. As Kirillov in The Possessed, Dostoevsky's novel says, no one asked me if I want to be born. We've come into existence with no choice, into an existence in which whatever we do, we will die. We're as good as dead to begin with. Our existence is characterized by necessity and mortality, period. But Christ has shown us what it is to be God in the very way he dies as a human being, laying down his life in love for us, and thereby showing us the way of life, freeing us from the fear of death, so that we can now follow him in using our breath to live a life of self-sacrificial love, a life which is that of the Spirit himself, the life of God. So by freely, voluntarily following him, taking up the cross, we can change the very basis of our existence from necessity and mortality to freedom and self-sacrificial love the very being of God himself. Now, in this way, then, the death which we have introduced into this world has been, as I put it, turned inside out. And now, in fact, it becomes the way of life. Sickness, suffering, and death, while on the one level they do result from our sin, yet on another more profoundly theological level, they can be seen as a means by which God trains us fashions us into human beings in his own image and likeness. We can, in fact, speak about the therapy of sickness, not how we cure illnesses, independent of the patient, but how sickness cures the patient. Irenaeus points out that there are two types of knowledge, the one which is gained through experience and that arrived at by opinion. 
It's only through experience that the tongue learns of bit, bitterness and sweetness. And in the same way, he says, we only come to learn the knowledge of good, obedience to God, which is life, through the experience of both good and evil, evil which is disobedience, which is death. So that we're in a position to reject the evil and adhere to the good. So through experience of both, he says, and casting away disobedience through repentance, human beings become ever more tenacious in their obedience to God. But Irenaeus says, if someone tries to avoid the knowledge of both of these and the twofold faculty of knowledge, he will forget himself and kill his humanity. He'll kill the human being in him. For the translators, I'm going to jump down to the bottom of the page to the case of Jonah. Because Irenaeus gives um, the example of Jonah to describe this. If you remember in the book of Jonah, Jonah, by God's arrangement, Jonah was swallowed up by the whale. Not so that he should die, but so that he should learn obedience. When having been cast out unexpectedly, he would be more obedient to God and so glorify him the more. Irenaeus then continues, this is the third and fourth quotation on your sheet. Having given the example of Jonah, uh, Jonah and what was happening with Jonah, Irenaeus continues. So also, from the beginning, God did bear human beings to be swallowed up by the great whale, who was the author of the transgression. Not that they should perish altogether and so engulfed, but arranging in advance the finding of salvation, which was accomplished by the word through the sign of Jonah, for those who held the same opinion as Jonah regarding the Lord, and who confessed and said, I am the servant of the Lord, and I worship the Lord God of heaven, who made a sea in the dry land. So that human beings receiving an unhoped for salvation from God might rise from the dead and glorify God and repeat, I cried to the Lord my God in my affliction, he heard me from the belly of Hades. And that they might always continue glorifying God and giving thanks without ceasing for that salvation which they have obtained from him. So that no flesh should glory in the Lord's presence and that human beings should never adopt an opposite opinion with regard to God, supposing that the incorruptibility which surrounds them is their own by nature, nor by not holding the truth should boast with empty superciliousness as if they were like by nature to God. So God has born the human race from the beginning, while the human race is swallowed up by the whale. But in doing so, God has already arranged in advance the finding of salvation accomplished by the word through the sign of Jonah. This is already a given, although it's unknown to the human beings before the incarnation. So they receive an unhoped for salvation, an unhoped for but divinely foreseen. I mean, this then continues, quotation number four. This is a direct continuation from number three. Such then was the patience of God, that human beings passing through all things and acquiring knowledge of death, then attaining to the resurrection from the dead and learning by experience whence they have been delivered, may thus always give thanks to the Lord, having received from him the gift of incorruptibility, and may love him the more, for he to whom more is forgiven loves more, and may themselves know how mortal and weak they are, but also understand that God is so immortal and powerful as to bestow immortality upon the mortal and eternity upon the temporal, and that they may also know the other powers of God being manifest in themselves, and being taught with them may think of God in accordance with the greatness of God. For the glory of the human being is God, while the vessel of the working of God and of all his wisdom and power is a human being. So God is patient, Irenaeus says, while we learn by experience through our own weakness and death, in our ungrateful apostasy, trying to live out our own life on our own terms, trying to preserve our life, we end up in sickness and death. But God is patient with all of this, knowing that having passed through the experience of death and having this unhoped for salvation given upon us, we will remain ever more thankful to God, willing to accept from him the eternal existence which he alone can give. So in this way, we become fully acquainted with the power of God by being reduced to nothing, by becoming dust in the earth. Human beings simultaneously come to know their total dependency upon God 
And so allow God to work in and through them to deploy his power in the weakness of their earthly vessels. And what's fascinating for me here is that both dimensions of the economy, the engulfing of man by the whale and the salvation wrought by the word, both of them are represented simultaneously by Jonah. Jonah is a sign of the transgressing human race and a sign of the Savior. So to conclude, the whole of the single economy of God leads from Adam to Christ. It's not plan A, plan B. It's a single economy that goes from Adam to Christ, from breath through death to the Spirit. It's a pedagogy in which God brings us to the stature of Christ, fashioning human beings in his image with a merciful and loving heart rather than a heart of stone. It provides an opportunity for learning patience, not to trust in oneself, to know that life doesn't come from the body but from God, to learn one's true dependence upon God, to provoke our prayer, to have compassion upon others, a sharing in a common vulnerability. In a word, the suffering of this life leads to humility, learned fully and finally in the guts and not just in the head, in the grave, when finally we become clay in God's hands and that he can then make a living human being. So the best definition I've ever found of a human being is quotation number five from Barnabas, letter of Barnabas. The human being is earth that suffers. The human being is earth that suffers. Best definition altogether. And if that is the case, then we can say with the apostle that we have every reason for joy. Quotation number six. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. Now, if all of this is so, and it is, then we can perhaps begin to understand the immense changes that have happened in the last half century to our understanding of the relationship between life and death that I spoke about at the beginning. If we don't know that life comes through death, then our horizons will be totally imminent. Our life will be for ourselves, for our body, for our pleasure, even if we think we are being religious or growing in our spiritual life. If we think that the healing provided by Christ, the great physician, is akin to the healing given by modern medicine with its own high priest, the doctor, we will never see beyond our own horizons. We will continue to block death out of our sight. We will forget what it is to be or to become human. We will, as Irenaeus put it, kill the human being with us. So I'd suggest that the greatest task for us today is not simply the matter of proclaiming the faith in an increasingly secularized world, or simply to speak about joy and hope without redefining what those terms mean, hoping that things will continue to get better on our terms as we conquer ever more illnesses. But rather, it's a matter of changing the presuppositions which have framed the modern world. We must take back death, just as we've taken back birth in the recent decades. The desacralization of the beginning and the end of life result in a hedonization of life, in which sickness, suffering, and death are deprived of any meaning, especially hope. Now, we might prefer to continue to deny all of this, but the fact that we are embodied beings means we cannot do so forever. So quotation number seven, the last one on your sheet. Herve Juvin, The Coming of the Body, he concludes his book by saying, Alone, the body remembers that it is finite. Alone, it roots us in its limits. Our last frontier, but for how long? And even if, especially if, it forgets, 
The body alone still prevents us from being God to ourselves and others. So we are, as I begin by saying, we are in crisis. We all know this. Yet perhaps we can now see that the real cause of the crisis is not simply one of our own making, because we've adopted the wrong economic policy, the wrong social program, or whatever it might be. Rather, we have been put in crisis by Christ himself. As he says when approaching the Passion, now is the judgment of the world. Literally, now is the crisis of the world. We've been challenged by him to see life and death otherwise than we might want. And this reversal is starker today than it's ever been before. And our judgment depends, as it always has, on how we respond to it. But we can now certainly respond with hope. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. Before we proceed with the questions, you can just put these headphones. Choose the channel number one, please. Uh, yeah. oh. Good. So we have time for uh, two short or one longer question. Does anybody here have questions? Yeah. Okay, whenever I give a talk and there are no questions at the end of it, it's either because everything I've said is so clear that there's no need for questions, or <coughs> nobody's understood a word I've been saying for the last hour, and there are no questions. Hopefully it's between the two. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, um, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, the question I have is uh, concerning um, um, the theological perspective on loss. Um, because what y y you speak, it's maybe refers to our kind of our own perception of our own mortality in, in the theological terms, but how about, um, for example, recent cases in, in Britain about um, um, these children who, yeah. whose, whose lives had to be stopped by the doctors and the family were um, protesting against it. So what would be your yeah. uh, take on that? It shows the incredible sharpness of the double edge of modern medicine. Yeah? On the one hand, modern medicine is absolutely wonderful in what it's been able to do with regard to sickness, with regard to prolonging life, and you know, all the kind of things which would have decimated, killed off any number of people 50 years, 100 years ago. Yeah? But on the other hand, it has simultaneously helped us escape from the fact that we are mortal. Yeah? And in fact, the one thing that the doctors generally are unable to deal with now is a question of mortality. Although in this case, it was slightly different. But largely, the doctors are un unable to deal with the question of mortality. Their job is to perpetuate life as long as it can. Um, until 100 years ago, or earlier, the, the medical arts also included the ars moriendi, you know, enabling a good ending to our life, because it will come to an end. I'm not talking about euthanasia. I'm talking about knowing that time is finite and that there is an end to life, and making that as good as that can possibly be in that full sense I was talking about earlier, with a, with a, parents, uh, with a family around, um, with them on the deathbed as they're bring, breathing their last breath. Today, however, um, it is usually the case in a modern hospital that when a doctor has come to the end of what he's able to do to perpetuate life, he will walk out of the room and leave it to the care of the, of the, of the nurse. He's completely unable to deal with the question of death. Yeah? So it's, it's really, really double-edged. Uh, in the specific case you're talking about, it is kind of anomalous because not anomalous, it's even kind of one step further removed than that because it was the doctors who were saying, no, this child is going to die. Yeah? And it was the parents with all sorts of other things going on behind that, as we're hearing about, that was trying to do everything they can simply to keep the child alive in the state the child was. Yeah? Um, 
And I think that that is motivated by the fact, or, or we're led into that kind of position because we no longer see death today. We've forgotten that, light, that our breath is mortal and we will die, but there's more to life than our breath. Yeah? I'm, I'm totally convinced that, that, that the fact of not seeing death today in that full scope I talk about. I mean, obviously, obviously there's um, any number of wars going on, famines going on, catastrophes going on, uh, bloodshed in all forms of shape that, that's going on in the world today, in the modern Western America as well. But we, tend, we, we do not see the kind of natural ending to life that we would have seen a generation or two ago. Yeah? And that has changed so much our being within the world. I actually think it's the biggest change ever in human existence, literally. Because before that, every generation in every culture throughout the world had to deal with death in an immediate way. We don't. Yeah? And that just skews our whole relationship with reality.